Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 117, 2020's Best, the best games we discovered in 2020. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, as we wrap up 2020, we're going to take a look back at this rather unique year and highlight some of the best games we discovered during it. Some shining lights in what was a rather dark year for most of us. Our featured reviews this week, we've got a couple of dice games, uh, Not Dice Squared and Back to the Future, Dice Through Time. There may be some overlap with those two topics, or there might not. You'll have to stay tuned to find out. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a number of comments on our list of great RPGs that use playing cards. David Fox writes, The best to me is Stranger Stuff Season 2 by Fat Goblin Games using the Verse M engine. Also enjoy their Verse Dragons and their Verse the Wasteland, which that I run a wonderful Wastes of Disney game in. <laughs> Now, patron Joe Swick wrote to say, I love murderous ghosts, but I never get to get it out. I was a playtester for it, and it's a lot of fun. Now, finally, J uh, JGM Gerrymander, perhaps GM Gerrymander, perhaps better known as Jerry on the Misdirected Mark Podcast Network, commented, I would like to recommend the TSR Watsi Saga system, both Marvel and Dragonlance. I always enjoyed th that system. Well, thanks all of you for your comments. Um, this is the first time I've heard of the Verse M engine. Um, I did Google it to take a look at what it was all about. I thought it was really cool to see that the original Verse Monsters game was actually a 24-hour RPG contest entry over at RPGD.com. Now, that's actually a contest I've entered five times and actually placed uh, first place a couple times. And I've got at least one system I made for it that I really should flesh out and I've probably been talking about for 10 years now that I'm eventually going to sit down and rework it and publish it. And now it's good to see that others haven't procrastinated as long as I have and some people have actually grown their 24-hour game into full series. Uh, we'll, of course, drop links in the show notes to all of those versus games. Now, what I probably won't drop a link to is Jerry's suggestion of the Saga system. Now, I got to say, it's a great game. I got to admit, I actually think the Saga system and the Fate deck included is some of the best RPG systems ever written back in its time period. But it was way before its time. It was very improv. Everyone gives um, Powered by the Apocalypse the credit for having uh, the DM doesn't roll any dice. Well, in old Fate games, the DM didn't draw any cards. They didn't play. They just interacted with the players. They never interacted with the random element. So it, I just think it was ahead of its time. And at the time, they were marketing to AD&D 2nd Edition players, and I just think they were like, ooh, whoa, this is too weird, right? It was just too strange. Now, the reason I'm not going to toss a link, though, is the actual topic was RPGs that use a standard deck of cards, right? A poker deck with, you know, your usual ace, spades, hearts, diamonds. These use custom decks, a custom fate deck. And there's one that's in the Dragonlance one, and there's one in the Marvel one, and they're not compatible, right? They're, they're definitely proprietary decks. Now, great suggestion. It is a fantastic card-driven game and one that I actually think is worth seeking out just to check it out, just to see what they were doing back then and where that's kind of led for some modern games. It just doesn't use a standard deck of cards. Now, interestingly, when I was Googling around on this, I found there is a Saga machine from Tab Creations okay. that does use a standard deck of playing cards, but it isn't related to the TSR no. system at all. But they do have a superhero game coming out soon, so that's who I'm going to be keeping an eye on. Sounds good. Now, up next, some bad news about The Shining Escape from Overlook Hotel, based on a comment on our YouTube review. Adventures of Mike writes, I must have received a broken copy as well. Mm. The items on the desk was way off, as well as the entries for the puzzle. Shake my head. Wow, I, I'm sorry to hear that, Mike, uh, both for your sake, for getting a game that didn't quite work out, and well, for the op and the Bamboozle Brothers. I was really hoping the problems were limited to the review versions, those first printings that went out. I hope this is something they're able to fix for future printings. It's, it's a solid game if it didn't have some printing issues. Yeah. As we've mentioned in the past, we love it when designers and publishers take the time to check out the content we create mm. about their games and give us feedback. 
That happened earlier this week when Matthew O'Malley left this comment on our Not Dice review on the blog. Thanks for the review, Mo. I like the way you brought it around to the current spate of roll and write games. I wonder what kind of roll and write we could make with Not Dice. Well, thanks for the comment, Matthew, and for letting us check out the game. As for a roll and write, I picture with Not Dice in particular a color and write where you've got this coloring book or maybe just like a panel with a knot work pattern on it, like something big, like a page of the book of Kells, right? And you roll the dice. And then based on what you roll on the dice, you get to color in a section of that pattern based on the pattern on the dice. And then you are all doing this simultaneously and the first person to complete the page or maybe a section of the page wins. That's the idea I had for it. Maybe I, that based on how interesting the puzzles are in knot dice, I bet you Matthew will probably come up with something even better. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. A couple of things we want to quickly cover before we get to the main topic in our announcements. All right, we will be recording our next show on December 30th. That is New Year's Eve Eve, if you will. Uh, and with everything going on for the holidays, I don't want to have to worry about trying to cover a full topic. So we're going to host an AMA for our last show of 2020. So join us here on Twitch, where we will be answering your questions live. Now, as usual, we would prefer if you joined us live, but if you can't and you have a short question for us to answer, just feel free to hit us up on social media or email us before next Wednesday. Now, we very recently made some pretty significant changes to our podcast flow and script, and we're wondering, as we move into a new year, if there's anything we can do to improve. Yeah, what I personally want to know is what type or types of content you want to see from us in 2021. Do you just want more of the same? Do you want more of something specific? Less of something we're doing? Or perhaps something new? As usual, you can let us know by email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Thanks to everyone who stops by and catches us live in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. All right, tonight, Sean and I are going to be talking about the best new games we've discovered this year. And of course, we'll be looking to the lobby because I want to know what games you discovered this year. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Today's question is pretty typical year-end question for every gaming podcast out there. And we wouldn't want to be the odd ones out by not talking about our best of 2020. That's right. We're taking the easy way out tonight, like many other shows this time of year. So tonight, we are highlighting the best games each of us have discovered in 2020. Note we said discovered, an important distinction. Yes, because before we get to the games, I don't know. I, I want to mention first off that, it, that I think we need to note that this was not your typical year. For anyone who may be listening to this, I don't know in the future because they decided to listen to our whole backlog or something 2020 was not a normal year in any way shape or form uh this has probably been the most unique year in many of our lives definitely our mine um in many ways and there's a lot of terrible stuff going on so i thought taking a break from thinking about that and focusing on some of the good that came out of it some of the fun we had playing games with others while there were no game physical game conventions this year when our actual number of physical game plays are way down, they were actually higher than I expected. The other thing that I've noticed with 2020 is it's way longer than one year, as far as I can tell, because I, when putting this list together, I was surprised that I have played over 150 different games this year. I would have never guessed it was that high. But then I kept seeing stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, Medium? No, oh, I played that like two years ago. No, that was February. Or Clans of Caledonia. We've been playing so many games on Board Game Arena. I just assumed I've been playing that forever. So that kind of threw me off. So we did play a surprising number of games, whether with friends, family, online, or in our bubbles. Indeed. While it's been a feature for us since well before 2020, many people yeah. discovered more online gaming than ever before and sites like our favorite, Board Game Arena. Yeah. Or Game Arena, you can send our payment too. <laughs> <laughs> anymore, it's getting to that point. I, uh... Give us a give us a free uh, subscription. I'd be happy with that. That'd, that'd be perfectly cool. Yep. Now, what I would have liked to have done, and this is what almost every other podcast is doing, I don't know where they're getting to play all their games, is a best of 2020 list. But not being able to hit the con scene in particular uh, really hurt this because the main way I get to try the new hotness is to demo them at the conventions. And then if they're interested enough, do full gameplays and then possibly bring the games home for more plays. 
So while I did get to try some new games in 2020, thanks to the publishers who were able to supply us review copies of those, most of what I played this year did come out prior to 2020. So this list of games are games that are new to us in 2020. Um, not even necessarily new to both of us. One might be new to one of us and not the other. And not necessarily published in 2020. Though some do were published in 2020. And as usual, we're in no particular order here whatsoever. Though I think mine actually came down to the number of times I played them. Because I went through my board game geek list. And that's how it sorts everything is by your number of plays. So I can't guarantee it. But this might be in order of the number of times I played the game in 2020. But might not. So number one, we're going to, oh, another thing too, is we're going to go through these a little quicker than our game recommendation episodes, where we try to sell you on the game. This is more just to give you a little quick overview and why we like the games, as opposed to a full, you know, short mini review. So number one for me, or the first one for me is Codenames Duet. This became a favorite date night game for Deanna and I. We play this almost any time we decide to have some charcuterie and beer. It's a two-player game but note it's not only two player this is part that people forget about codenames duet it's actually a team game and we actually had a lot of fun playing with the extended family playing six players three per side next i've got the fox in the forest series i'm putting these both together for a change this is the fox in the forest fox in the forest duet one competitive one co-op both two player trick taking games we mentioned this so many times on the show i don't think i need to go on about it anymore um this is kind of like the azul of 2020 versus where last year we talked way too much about azul this is our most recommended game this year pretty much every time we do a game list this ends up on it well and next is medium i doubt there are too many people who haven't at least heard of this one this year but at the beginning of the year i actually got to play this one in person with real people and what seemed like a silly idea turned out to be great fun as laughter filled the room quickly <laughs> while it's not going to be work as well with just any old players when the right shared experiences meet in the middle you get an experience which is anything but merely medium Next, I've got Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I am still shocked that they published a huge mass market big box game like, like a version of Gloomhaven at Target. This was a Target exclusive. I did not expect this to work. I thought this was going to flop, and it did not. It got so many new people into hobby gaming. That's fantastic. And the reason for that is this is a fantastic entry point for Gloomhaven. It's got great onboarding, something that was completely missing from the original. If you are considering picking up Gloomhaven, Frosthaven, or any of the games, start with Jaws of the Lion. There's no reason not to. And I see a lot of talk about this one as the sort of people's game of the year. Yeah. Next, I have one that we just talked about last week, which is not Dice. My only regret about this game is I should have backed the Kickstarter when I first saw it. Like, it looked neat, and I was eh, wishy-washy. I'm like, I wish I would have been part of funding this. These are really cool dice with fun games. And what I'm expecting from this one is when things return to normal, this is going to become a new date night game for Deanna and I. When we go out, when we go to uh, Kingsville to go to Jack's Gastro Pub, or we're sitting at a, at a, at a, a, a brew pub playing at a pub or a cafe where you don't have much table space because once you learn the games all you really need is the dice well next up is azul summer pavilion the third of the azul games and a very solid offering while i still think it isn't quite as perfect as the original it sits in the list above sintra in the series mm -hmm. as a real go-to game its need for more space than the original is the one thing that really kind of knocks it out of, out of the running for best of azul games now, for me, I actually prefer it to Azul nowadays. If I'm going to sit down and play Azul, I'm going to grab Summer Pavilion. Unless, again, I'm going to go to a coffee shop, but that's not well, happening again, this year. Again, size is part of it, right? It, yeah. it just has that much bigger footprint. But for getting together with my local group in my basement, I'm going to grab Summer Pavilion. Yep. Next up, Quad Heroes from Ryan Eiler. Uh, it's too bad Tech's not in the chat. He'd be clapping right now. Uh, this My kids love this game. Like, I like it. It's a solid game. It's a, it's sort of it's, it's sort of program movement where you have a cube-shaped character and you tumble the character and what side's facing up is how they move. Amazing production values. Like, up there, top-notch. Almost as good as, like, mechs versus minions. Uh, a bit of a pain to start, though. Like, there's a lot of tiles and a lot of pieces. But once you get it set up, it's a ton of fun playing. Now, here's uh, possible somewhat insider info. There is a new edition of Quad Heroes that will be launching on Kickstarter next year. 
Up next, I have Clans of Caldonia. This is the one that just does not feel like I've been playing it for less than a year. Like, like it feels two, three years at least of experience playing Clans of Caldonia. I would have believed the first, you know, new new on digital, but I would have, I thought you had played this previously yeah. in physical. But I know I bought it on Boxing Day. Huh? Like, I, I remember I bought it at the, the CG Realm Boxing Day sale, and I didn't get it played until January, February. So it makes sense when I think about it, when I got it and everything else. But yeah, this is a great Scottish-themed engine building and economic game. Tons of asymmetry with the different clans, and not just a retheme of Terra Mystica. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And, uh, and we play it all the time. <laughs> Next up is Gorus Maximus. Trick-taking and gladi- gladiatorial gore. This game soars at higher player counts, mm-hmm. and if you don't mind the cartoony yet graphic depictions of violence on the card, you're in for a great and unique trick-taking game as Trump changes while you're playing a hand. Yeah, mid-hand. And there is a re-theme without it, but we're not going to dive into that tonight. Next, I have the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Core Set. Now, it's important. It's called Core Set, not Base Set. This just came out in 2019. This is a newly revised and updated version of the popular Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. Very engaging hand management deck construction game that Deanna and I have really enjoyed playing through as a two-player experience. Um, Everything we can see about this has been improved with the new edition. Every little change they've done, the tweaks to the art, the refining of the different keywords, all looks awesome. My only complaint is a lousy box insert. (laughs) Next, some real new hotness. This is just showing up at Kickstarter backers' homes right now as we speak this week is Chronicles of Crime 1400. This was my first experience with the Chronicles of Crime system, which has been out for a couple of years and people have really kind of gone nuts for, but I hadn't tried it myself. I was impressed. I, I Way more fun doing this than I thought I would. And the use of the app in this is so brilliant to create a very immersive experience. It sold me on playing mystery games. And plus, I love the 1400 medieval setting. I just think that's way cooler than just being a British geek cop. <laughs> well, next up is The Crew. This is one we had been told we needed to play. And it got added as an honorable mention as a result to our trick-taking episode. Mm-hmm. So when we found out it was on B- uh, Board Game Arena, we jumped on it, and we don't regret it at all. Oh. We've had a few games now, and while it really needs real-time play, mm-hmm. don't try playing turn-based. It is a brilliant implementation of trick-taking taking in a co-op setting. Yeah, I've really enjoyed that. Looking forward, I do have the physical copy now, thanks, Tech. Uh, one, of our, one of our fans sent us that copy. Looking forward to playing the physical copy once we can play with more people. Unfortunately, here it's not great two-player, but we will test that out sometime soon. Next up, I have an expansion. I wasn't sure if I wanted to put expansions on here, but you know what? It's an expansion for Orléans. It's an older expansion. It might be the oldest thing on this list. I'm not positive on that, though. I love Orléans. I, I consider it one of the best games in my collection. Like probably top five up there with, uh, with Shogun and Power Grid. And this expansion took the original and only made it better, mostly. While we weren't fans of the intrigue part and the backstabbing, every other aspect, the other three modules of this expansion I thought were amazing and just improved on the original, and I don't plan on playing without them ever again. Absolutely. Orlean is, is, is great, and, and I agree. Intrigue is just meh, not yeah. our style. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's people out there. Like, I talk to the group who are all about cutthroat backstabbing, even they don't like it. So, yeah. I don't know. I think they just went a little too far on that one. Well, too much take that and what's a generally a euro game yep next i've got harry potter house cup competition uh this is one we still haven't even reviewed on the blog but we have been playing it this was the biggest surprise for me this year i don't know what i expected but i wasn't expecting an extremely solid entry-level worker placement game like to me this replaces wards of water deep as the game you show off how, how what worker placement is it's just that step down in complexity because you're not building buildings and there's no intrigue cards but you're still collecting stuff to complete missions while the iconography could use a bit of work the gameplay more than makes up for it uh, next up for me is rally man gt this was an unexpected one that i got invited to on board game arena but after going in without knowing it as a first play disaster, I watched the rule vid, figured out the concept I've been missing, and since then it has been a huge favorite online. 
and I almost backed a new uh, version mm-hmm. of off-road version on Kickstarter until I realized I really didn't have the group to play it with. Yeah. Um, it's not a great two-player game, especially, but again, as you get enough cars on the track, it really soars. Yeah, I got to try the two players just to see how the mechanics work, and I thought it was really neat. It was much lighter than I thought it was going to be, but not in a bad way. Yep. I am looking forward to beginning into some of those online games in the new year when I've got time to actually play. Yeah, I'm about to crush everybody in, in our, uh, our our latest uh, race, so uh, nice. we should have another one going soon. Next, I have Bastille. Uh, this one's also a surprise in the way that it's it's the biggest hidden gem on the list tonight, in my opinion. This is the one no one else has heard of. Now, I expect it to be good, so it's not like it surprised me, but it was better than I thought. This is a game set in the French Revolution, combines worker placement with bidding in a pretty unique way, using uh, prestige to do things. What really blows me away about this game, though, is the design and iconography. I actually hold this up as a shining example of great graphic design whenever we're talking about design of board games. For just easy-to-see iconography that you can read from across the board, and that almost walks you through play with a series of icons. Next, I've got Sanctum from Czech Games Edition. This is Diablo in board game form. This is a unique game. Like, it's, it's not what you'd expect when you hear a Diablo game, but then it kind of is. Like, there's lots of dice chucking, but it's all about collecting the right equipment to mitigate all the randomness of that dice chucking. You're going to kill lots of beasties to get better gear. Everything you kill drops gear. And then once you're equipped up, go take on the Demon Lord. Now, there are some idiosyncrasies to this game that means it won't be for everyone, but we've really enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's 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 odd because it's it's a... It's a Euro, but it's not. I mean, it's a dice chucking Euro in many ways. Yeah, exactly. That's which is which is just strange. <laughs> it's a, definitely a unique game. It's it's not what I would have done if I designed a Diablo video board game, but yeah. it works. Now, next up is Corridor, a seemingly simple abstract game with a single pawn and some walls, and you just have to get to the other side of the board. And if you think that means it must be easy, you must not play many abstract games. <laughs> This is a brain burner, and it can really bend the brain at four players due to the bi-directional crossings that are going on. Yeah, this is definitely the oldest game on the list. Um, I would have had this on the list too, but I've actually played that growing up with my dad. So I was the one that introduced Sean to it after like, oh my God, you never played Corridor. It's way better than I remembered. And then when I played it, I'm like, oh, it's way better than I remembered. (laughs) Because when I was a kid, I wasn't picking up on some of those strategies. Yeah, it's, it's there's a lot to it. Yeah, this is you can find that everywhere. Uh, Gigamic Games picks it up, and it's well worth it. Also beautiful too. It's one of those you leave it out on a desk or on a on, on a end table or centerpiece. Yep. Next, I've got eight seventy eight Vikings. This is one I would have sworn I played in twenty nineteen, but it ends up I played it this year. I gotta admit, this one I I need to play this more. Like I feel bad. This was the the first game in the Birth of Europe series, which is a follow-up to the popular Birth of America series that many people have raved about. This is a folk on a map game that really impressed Deanna and I, and I'm still looking forward to playing it with more players. This is one I really want to try out more, but to really shine, I need a bigger group. And unfortunately, heavy war games aren't really something I'm sharing with the kids at this point. Next up, I've got Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster. Now, we did play a handful of Exit games this year. Um, House of Riddles, Catacombs of Horror. I think there was a couple other ones, but Haunted Roller Coaster stood out as the best of the bunch. This particular escape room game had just this great mix of different styles of puzzles, the thematic elements, and just a lot of whimsy to this one that just it was it was fun and whimsical while playing it that we really enjoyed. And I still, to this time, say... This is the gateway exit game right now. If you are going to try an exit game from Cosmos, pick up hit a Haunted Roller Coaster as your first one. Well, next up is Concept. Now, this is hardly a new game, nope. and it's one we've talked about many times on the show. I'd simply never had the opportunity to play it. So this year, as we wrapped up the 24 hours of Extra Life, we discovered a beta version of it on mm-hmm. Board Game Arena and played a handful of games in what turned out to be a great interface for the game yeah. to play. And... Just this morning, they announced that it is officially released on Board Game Arena as part of the 27 or 25 games of uh, Christmas. What shocked me the most is how well it worked with two players. I've always played Concept with a group of like 5, 10, 20 people. Playing it two players worked surprisingly well, just taking turns giving clues. 
Next, I have Coimbra. Uh, this is another one that, like 878 Vikings, I feel bad for not getting more plays in. I've had this on my pile of shame way too long. People have been raving about this game. Well, they raved about it until supposedly there's a broken strategy that everyone stopped raving about it. I personally haven't read that. Don't tell me. I don't want to know because we haven't figured it out yet. Um, having not figured it, this out, this blew me away. I'm like, oh, man, I, this is great. Like, this is one of those games that could be up there with the, with the Shoguns and the Power Grids and stuff like that, though I haven't played it enough to know for sure. Like, people love multi-use cards. Well, this is that, but multi-use dice. Like your dice aren't only used to determine your player order and who gets to draft first, but what types of citizens you draft and then which of the four tracks you go up. I need to get this one played more. This is one one that I, I got one play in and we haven't been back to it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, Coimbra. I got to play that more. Up next, I have Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Now this one did take its time getting here. Uh, it was due, I think, over a year before it actually showed up. This new updated version of Eclipse was totally worth the wait. Uh, besides being amazing looking with uh, the UV details on the board and a whole bunch of miniatures and custom dice, the gameplay is just as good as ever. I've always been a big fan of Eclipse. I actually prefer Eclipse to Twilight Imperium. Um, I loved it. And the minor tweaks they did made the game tighter and a little more competitive without as many runaway leader problems. No more finding a dreadnought out in space and just trancing anyone. Sorry, Sean Hamilton. Not Sean from Hamilton. Well, next up is Emotep, another not new for the show, but new to me. Mm -hmm. Now, playing this one just reinforced every good thing we have said about it on the show. It yeah. really is a game that belongs in pretty much everyone's collections just due to the sheer variety of play you can get mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah, I'm still a huge fan of Emotep. If, if we were still doing public events, I'm sure I would have had way more plays of that this year. Next up, I have Nyctophobia. I felt I had to include this one just because of how different it is, how unique it is. There's nothing else out there like Nyctophobia, and it was a joy to play and discover this game. This is a game where all but one player is playing literally blinded through blindfold glasses or blackout glasses. Maybe not the best game ever made, but this was a really cool experience that I think needs to be highlighted. Next, I have Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. I, to, For me, this might be my game of the year. This, this is, in my opinion, the best game in the list with my family. This was the game my family had the most fun playing together ever with the four of us, Deanna and myself and my two girls. We've never had a better time with the four of us at a table laughing and working together and the kids just like, like laughing so hard they started feeling ill in a good way, right? <laughs> like it was great. Now, the problem why I don't know if I'd want to actually put it on that best game pedestal is the fact it's a one and done. You can only ever have that experience once. And my kids are constantly now begging me to play another mystery style game and I don't have one to present to them. So I don't know that that one and done hurts it. But man, is that a great experience, especially with kids who get into it. Excellent. Now, I'm going to finish off the list with the only RPG on the list, sadly. Um, the reason I save this for last two is because both of us played this sean and i this was both our only rpg of the year i was the only one we played in 2020 and i gotta say that's just weird like it's sean and i only played one game and we played it together like that probably hasn't happened since the 1990s <laughs> so that's kind of strange um it's been a long time since that happened now i'm not just highlighting it because it's the only one we played like please don't get that idea that it's it's the best because it's the best game we played all year because it's the only game we played no it, we actually had a lot of fun i had a lot of fun running this for sean and some of our patreon patrons super rules light high improv but really unique and tons of fun and did give that dungeon crawly feel no absolutely uh again it's my only only played rpg of the year although i have been collecting a bunch in hopes of playing <laughs> other th things uh at some point in the future so didn't you have an online game of something going? A play by forum? Uh there's or was some... that was that twenty nineteen? That was at the end of twenty nineteen. Oh was, okay. yeah. That was masks. Yeah. All right, we do have three honorable mentions that we're gonna bring up tonight as well that don't quite get to our best new discoveries of twenty twenty. For me, the first one is the Alien RPG starter set. This RPG box set from Freely Publishing just blew me away in almost every way it could. Like, first, just how much is in there. Like, it's just packed full. 
And it's a great value because a lot of the stuff that's in that box, you can buy separately. And if you add up the price separate compared to what you pay in the box, it's just a great deal. Then the quality was up there. Like it's all top notch, but most of all the rules, like there are some great changes to the year zero engine that really do a good job of capturing that tension and feel that you want from an alien experience. The only reason it's not on the main list, though, is I haven't actually played it. I've just read through everything in the box. Well, next up on our honorable mentions is Gorinto, because, well, it's not actually out yet. Yeah. This game was a Kickstarter preview that we were sent, but it really caught our attention. And while still in a rough form physically when we had it, mm -hmm. everyone who got to try it thoroughly enjoyed it. The Kickstarter was successful, uh, successfully funded, and the final design for the game looks amazing. Yeah. We look forward to seeing great things from this game when it finally gets onto people's tables. Yeah, I think some people are starting to get copies. It's out there. It's, it's getting out to people, but there are obviously some uh, shipping delays in the world right now. I am really looking forward to playing this in like physical with the plastic tiles and everything. Yeah. Gorinto yeah. blew me away. That was one of the, like, the, I'm like, I, I get pre Kickstarter previews fairly often and they're usually enjoyable that was like wow like this is good this is this is a fantastic game and i got a huge props to mark specter from grand gamers guild for the interaction we had that whole time like i mentioned when i first played it we were sitting at a coffee shop and i had rules questions and he got back to me right away it was amazing so great experience there overall now my last game on the list is another kickstarter preview and that was for macaron this is a trick-taking game that really impressed Deanna, and even more so her mom. Dee's mom actually asked us to leave our preview copy at her house so she could play it more often. Uh, this is a trick-taking game with a twist. It did fun, but I'm sad to say barely. So I hope Sunrise Tornado set their target at a good spot, that it's still going to be good. Um, it's not their first game, so I expect it will get delivered. But I am looking forward to seeing this one hit the market. And I'm really hoping for their sake, because it's really good, that it takes off once more people get experience with the game and people start playing it. All right, well, that's it for this, uh, for our 2020's best games list. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see what the folk in the lobby discovered this year. So let's have a chat room. What were the best games you played this year? Uh, we've got one from Danielle in our chat room. It was a 100 word RPG uh, off of, out of a zine that she was introduced to in 2019, but didn't actually play until 2020 called okay. Sword Loser. Sword Loser. So from Jackson Tegu, uh, I think that's how you pronounce the name. Uh, the Sword Loser is a story of a lovable rake named Tynegald who has a bad habit of losing swords. With a okay. group of friends, you create the stories behind his rec recent acquisitions and losses. See, when it said sword loser, I thought like the person's a loser, not they lost. <laughs> nope, they lose, they find and lose swords and you tell the story of it. Oh, Very and Jen cool. Adcock ran it. So it, it must have been, that would have been <laughs> well, that, That's uh, that an added bonus. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had a surprisingly quiet chat room. No one played any games this year. I was expecting like a list. Well, unfortunately, I mean, other than Danielle, everyone else has played all the games with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. Uh, I'd love to hear what Deanna's favorite games of the year she played were because I'm sure they're different than mine. Well, more than likely, yes. Uh, <laughs> there's definitely a, a weight differential in, in preferences. Uh, yes. Uh, Quad Heroes probably wouldn't have come in on her list. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure Quad <laughs> Heroes is not on that list whatsoever. Uh, Hidden Worlds inc Inclusion. Yep. We we'll learned about it. Yeah. Well, that, that's all. You know, you'll. You learn about stuff, and but if you if you haven't gotten to the table, I knew about Imhotep a long time before I actually got it to the table in twenty twenty. Yeah, so Deanna Deanna's backing me up on yep, Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo, the, the Scooby Doo with the kids, like oh, just see him. Our, my kids play that, and their reactions when they when they're like, "What we're gonna have Shaggy eat the butler? What are we gonna have Shaggy eat the butler?" Yeah, and they I, actually expected like the yeah. the Shaggy to eat the butler. It's <laughs> it's a shame that The Shining has had issues. Because yeah. that could hurt the next, and I know they, I know there is a next. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen them talking about uh, wrapping it up. I know there is another Coded Chronicles system. Yeah. Um, and and it's a shame that that they sort of possibly tarnished the system's reputation a bit. Very true. Uh, what I haven't done, except for the feedback we got on our own review, is look to see what other people are saying. So yeah, I, I, I haven't, haven't seen either haven't way, seen to be honest. I haven't looked at the reviews. No. Yeah, Deanna's saying one of the best games of the year. 
and it did something unique and the girls loved it so much. I agree. Like, like, yeah. oh, absolutely. I just hate to put something one and done as a game of the year. If I, if I had to announce the best game, which uh, there's the part we didn't do is, is what is, what is the best game out of all these, which uh, actually so, I'm going to have to scroll back up. So shining but, is not, uh, not, not rated. It's only 12 ratings total and only one comment oof. on. Wow. BGG. That's so no one's so, even buying I don't, it. I don't think anyone's got it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, maybe it's not as mass market yet. There's only tw- only 29 people even have it as fan or, or listed as fans on the game. So, yeah, uh, trade um, and intrigue for Orleans way up there, but I hate, again, I can't make that a 2020 game of the year, right? Or even close. I, I'm gonna have to say Jaws of the Lion is, is up there, or Clans of Caledonia. Now, if I had to pick out of the games I played from 2020, I'm gonna have to say Jaws of the Lion probably. Oh, uh, Vin- uh, Venus was uh, it was due for May. That's uh. That's true. You guys, they they, they yes. really like their the the plays of Venos. Yeah, I have, I had played Venos in twenty nineteen, yeah, so that's not on my list. Uh, Clans of Caledonia, the NSA, consistently enjoying Clans of Caledonia. Yep. Um, May liked Nyctophobia and Venos Deluxe Edition. Venos Deluxe Edition is really good. It's just I played that one in twenty nineteen, but I think that's a fantastic yep. game. That I I don't know. I understand it, right? So why? Vital Lacerda's games, like maybe it's my fault. I haven't played his other ones, but no one talks about Vinos. All you ever hear about is um, Tricurion and Lisboa and uh, the new one on Mars. I'm like, are they that much better than Vinos? Because Vinos is really good. I'll admit, CO2 Second Chance did not live up to my expectations from Vital. I, I mean, it was disappointing. The deluxe edition comes in at an 8.2 on BGG. Yeah, so it's, people like there. it. I mean, there's that's I, a high... maybe it's just no one's talking about it and that's that's with with four thousand ratings it's got an 8.2 i mean so how's that compared to lisboa because that's uh, the one everyone says is his best uh if i can spell then it would actually help (laughs) l-i-s-b-o-a no i know how to spell i just can't type it all right um (laughs) 8.2 so six thousand rating also an 8.2 yeah more ratings so yeah like i said people say lisboa we we sat down to play lisboa uh, with Neil and Big J, and Big J ended up canceling. Like, we were actually sitting there, like, the game set up on the table, and we got a text, and it's one of those, like, only plays well with certain player counts or whatever, right. and we end up playing something else with Neil instead, and I don't remember what. I think we introduced Neil to Gentis. I think it might have been. Right. Now, but Engine yeah, Games is pointing out, CO2 is probably one of the games I hated most yeah. of this year, and I have to say, uh, you know, she calls it a misery game, and it's it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, he, it's a he political deliberately, statement. deliberately said that. Uh, and there's, you know, you're not supposed to play that version of the game if you want to have a, a fun game. Yeah. No, so. it's true. I, we need to play CO2 with the, the, the easy hack yeah, yeah. and see if it's at all enjoyable. Because that's Cause it supposed was not, to be how the like, game is. Like, that's, yeah, that's the like game it. game versus the... What's been how, published. Yeah, we're yes. all going to we're all gonna die game. <laughs> no, it's it's true. Uh, CO2, we did... I, I dropped it because it was it was that miserable. Like we played yep. twice. We played co op, then we played competitive, and so far, based on reviews, no one has ever won playing competitive. Which again is a statement. It's if yep. you yep. don't no, work absolutely. together to defeat carbon and climate change, you're gonna fail. I, I yeah, I get the uh, I get the point, but I don't need my board game to prove that to me repetitively. Interestingly, that one's at seven point seven. Yeah, I wonder how much I, of that's I mean, based yeah. on I, it's the, the original the game, or I don't know. <laughs> is co2 second chance a separate entry yeah it is okay and so? it's i mean it's it's overwhelmingly rated at eight by people huh. um yeah i found that rough but again maybe with that hack yeah maybe i mean, I, I hope that's all that's how they're reading it because otherwise it's just a, a game. or it's like i said people who played the non-deluxe who are reading the deluxe because i liked the original that's why i backed the original and i kind of wish i kept my old copy but i sold it before the other one showed up to recoup the cost which is what i often do with stuff with new editions as soon as i hear about the new edition i decide to buy it i try to sell my copy for a pretty good price and then only in paying the upgrade cost which has worked pretty well so yeah deanna's basically saying jaws alliance slick did a great job of streamlining it fox of the forest was one of the favorites um not duet Duet's good, but the competitive she liked better, which isn't surprising. Not surprising, <laughs> <laughs> not surprising at all. Um, uh, Danielle's basically so hard to get anything to the table. When we're trying yeah. to isolate from friends, and the two of us are just worn out from work. Yeah, no, we definitely had that problem. Like I and like I've been playing stuff online, but not a lot. I still prefer to play in person, and yeah. there's only so many games you can play two player, and 
plus we've been working too uh, it's, we we worked more hours once everything hit than we did before yeah no so, absolutely so not not every night do we want to sit downstairs and play games yep it has been a rough one yep all right i think we're good uh not the busiest chat room tonight but thank you very much for those of you who did take part Finally, as always, if you have a game or game night question for me, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. It's time for us to take a look at Not Dice Squared, an expansion for the Celtic Knotwork dice game, Not Dice. Thank you, Black Oak Games, for providing us with a review copy of this expansion. And Not Dice Squared, along with the original game, Not Dice, was designed and published by Matthew O'Malley under his company independently published as Black Oak Games. Uh, these dice were originally kickstarted in 2018 and hit retail earlier this year in 2020. This expansion does require a set of Not Dice to play. By combining this set with the original di dice, you get a number of games and puzzles that will play from one to six players. To get a look at the new dice included in this deck, be sure to check out our Not Dice Squared unboxing video on YouTube. Uh, you may also want to check out our review of Not Dice if you're not familiar with these costume dice sets by Black Oak Games yet. You can catch that review as part of episode 116, Non-Game Gifts for Gamers, or YouTube on YouTube or the blog. All right, so the dice here are just as nice as the ones in Not Dice. The quality is the same. Um, for those who haven't seen the original, these are larger than your standard die. They are measured 20 millimeters squared. Not work patterns on these dice are deeply etched into the dice and inked with silver. The dice are colored to look like Connemara marble. You get three types of dice in Not Dice squared. You get round and square pattern dice, nine of each, and then eight bridge dice. Now, the round and square pattern dice are fully compatible with each other, and they match all six sides, match with any other six side of those two sets. But they're not compatible with the original cross pattern dice that were in the knot dice. That's where the eight bridge dice come in that allow you to connect the two new patterns to the original pattern. So that's 18 new unique knot dice, same as the original box, as well as eight dice that connect the two sets. Yep. Now, just like Not Dice, uh, you're also getting two rather thick books, one with new puzzles and another with new games that you can now play with your larger collection of Not Dice. In addition, you do have two more sets of tokens in new colors, so now you can play with up to six players, games that need tokens. Now, how has Not Dice Squared expanded on Not Dice? All right, so we'll start with the puzzle book. The puzzle book this time has six different types of puzzles five of which are the same as the puzzles in Not Dice, just using Not Dice, uh, using the new dice. One is totally new. Now, the puzzles that carry it over are the creation puzzles, the completion puzzles, the transformation puzzles, and the building puzzles. Again, check out our other review for more details on what those are. Now, the new puzzle type I want to highlight is the simultaneous puzzle. These can be played by multiple players simultaneously as a race to complete set patterns. Everyone gets their own set of dice from the four dice types and tries to complete a series of patterns shown in the book before the other players finish a different set. Now, and can you get six players doing the simultaneous puzzles, or is that too many for the number of dice? With one set of not dice and one set of not dice squared, you can get up to four people playing simultaneously. There are sets of puzzles for one player, two player, three player, and four. Now, the game book has new games. There are 10 different games included. Now, eight of these are just updated versions of games that were in the original Not Dice, and two are completely new. Now, for the overlapping games, every single one of these are games where you were going to draft dice, roll them, and add them to a pattern in some way. Now, what the change is with Not Dice Squared is that you separate the dice into four piles based on the dice type, the original uh, cross pattern, the square pattern, the round pattern, and the bridge dice. When drafting, you're just going to pick which pile to choose from. Other than that, the games are identical. They play exactly the same as not dice, just you're choosing from a pile instead of one central pool. So what I want to highlight here are the two new games. The first is Forget-Me-Nots with the number four. This is a solo game where you're trying to build eight different completed patterns of dice simultaneously. You start with four dice drafted from the four different types. You roll them, and then each turn, you have to add at least one of these dice to one of the eight patterns. 
And once you've added at least one die, you can roll the dice you're left. And then you have to place at least one die. And you keep doing that until you place all four dice. Then you're going to draft four more dice and keep doing that. You're going to keep going until either you run out of dice and you lose, or you complete eight patterns. The second new game is Hedgerows. This is a two-player only 3D pattern building game where you're going to be stacking the dice. One player takes the 18 original not dice, and the other player takes the 18 non-bridge dice from not dice squared. Players are working to build one large green hedge with not work patterns on the sides. Players are going to grab three of their dice and roll them. Two dice have to be placed every turn. Now, after the first die is placed, all subsequent dice must be placed either touching an opponent's die or the space next to an opponent's die where an opponent's die would be. So what this represents is the hedge slowly growing outward from a central set of dice. After all dice are played, you play through multiple rounds, players are going to get points based on what completed patterns they have on their side, getting one point per die that's in a completed pattern. So despite the nice chunky books, most of it is really just adding in the new dice to the original games and not all new games, which I think is fair, mm -hmm. but important to know that you're not getting as much new game with this set of dice. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're getting new ways to play the old games in most cases with a couple new games and one new puzzle type. And to be honest, the one new puzzle type is basically an old puzzle type that multiple people can play at once. What has been removed is any of the ones where you're sliding dice into the edge or side of a pattern, which makes sense because these new dice don't match with the old dice. So when you slide dice in, you're not going to get completed patterns. So it kind of kind of makes sense the ones they omitted. All right, as I noted with my Not Dice review, I still think that Not Dice and its expansion are worth the cost just for a cool set of dice. Like these are great looking dice. These are a conversation piece. These are the kind of thing you could leave out as a centerpiece or on a coffee table or a desktop toy as, as an art object or a knickknack, right? Something to fiddle with. In that regard, interestingly, despite what it says on all the boxes, you don't actually need a set of not dice to use not dice squared because these dice all work perfectly well with each other, including the bridges. And you can use these to make all kinds of cool stacking patterns. It's only once you get into the actual games and puzzles in the books that you actually need a set of not dice. And even then, there's actually a couple... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Most I am for a sec. Do, 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 do. This is what happens. <clears throat> You're still muted. I can't, I can't see the blinky button. All right, let's try that again. Even then, there are some games and puzzles you can play with just the dice in the box. But overall, I think most people who pick up a set of this are going to want the original dice. But it is nice to know that if someone was given this expansion as a gift, for instance, it wouldn't be completely useless without the original, just significantly underused. So most of the games in the puzzle of this set are, as Sean mentioned, just updated versions of the originals with some minor changes. But what we did find is just adding in that new set of dice, all of those original puzzles and games become significantly harder. Uh, these dice just don't fit together the way you expect them to, especially with the bridge dice. And it takes you quite a while, I find, to get used to what types of patterns work with each other and when the bridge dice are needed and where they work. And even just recognizing what's a cross edge versus a straight edge. The puzzles in particular really ramp up in difficulty once you have all four types of dice. So some of the patterns are build a cube that's two by two by two, right? Uh, that uses all four dice types and has one complete pattern on it. And that's it. Like that's your whole direction. We couldn't do it. Like we tried for a while. We never did figure this one out. We'll, eventually, I'm sure we will. But just adding in the variation of the four different types of dice really ramps up the difficulty of those puzzles. Whereas the puzzles in the original game, we actually found like almost deceptively easy. It was like, yeah, yeah, okay, obviously these go together this way. I also really dig the fact that there's now a puzzle for up to four players playing simultaneously. Though I gotta say, whoever is has done that research, played with the dice most, who knows which sides fit together just at a glance, is gonna win. So it's going to have, uh, like, whoever owns the dice is probably going to win that game. You have a big advantage by uh, whoever's most comfortable with them, I think. 
as for the two new boat games, I think they're both interesting. Um, I like the hedge theme. I like it. I, I like the fact you can only place where someone else plays, and it kind of has to grow organically. I thought that was a neat thing to tie to it. Um, and I also do like the fact that now I no longer feel the need to buy a second set of not dice. Where reading through not dice, it was like, yeah, you can play this two player, but if you want to play four, you need two sets. If you want to play six, you need three. I'm glad that this replaces that. That now I can play up to six players with my set. So that that made me pretty happy. Overall, I am amazed just the 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 design work that went into these dice, the 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 creative mind of of Matthew O'Malley who designed these, and how he got it to work, like the thought process and math involved in getting these four different types of dice to work together boggles my mind, and I am really impressed by this. The dice, of course, look amazing. The puzzles are engaging and fun. This does what I want from every expansion published by anyone. It adds to and improves the existing game without changing it into something new. If you own a set of not dice and enjoy playing with them, just consider picking up a copy of Nice Dice Squared. Not Dice Squared. I said Nice Dice. Nice Dice are probably something else. But yeah, if you own not dice, pick up Not Dice Squared, this expansion set. It's going to give you more of what you already like. More dice, more games, more puzzles. You could also pick this up as a standalone set. Again, something that makes a cool display piece or a fiddle toy. In general, though, this is designed to expand on Knight's Dice, and you can only play most of the games with the original set. So I do think if anyone's like seen my recent posts on Instagram or whatever, oh, those look so cool, I would still recommend start with Knot Dice, and then if you dig Knot Dice, consider picking this up. All right. Well, you can also check out our written review of Knot Dice by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews. Now look at Back to the Future, Dice Through Time, from Ravensburger, who I must also thank for sending us a review copy of this game. All right, Back to the Future, Dice Through Time, was designed by Ken Franklin, Chris Leader, and Kevin Rogers, published in 2020 by Ravensburger. One play of this dice-driven cooperative game takes about an hour or longer, depending on which difficulty you decide to play at. Now, Dice Through Time is a cooperative game where two to four players take on the role of Marty and Doc, each starting at a different timeline. Yes, that's right. Each player is playing Marty and Doc. Players are working together to stop Biff, who's stolen the DeLorean and messed with the timeline for his own profit. Now, you do this by traveling through time, completing events to earn items, and then returning those items to the proper place and time. To get a look at the components in this time travel board game, be sure to check out our Back to the Future Dice Through Time unboxing video on YouTube. I also go over the components in the game on detail on the blog version of this review. What I will say here, without getting into too much detail, is that the components are rather good. You got a solid looking, wow, it's bright board, uh, plastic DeLorean tokens, thick player boards, lots of cards, and some pretty cool custom dice. Now, I do want to call out a rather unique look to this game. The aesthetic of this game is, is not what you would expect from a Back to the Future game. Like, my guess is Ravensburger did not get the license to the movie or the comic book artwork or the actors or anything like that. Because everything in this game has this, I, I'm having a hard time describing it. It's like this blocky, chunky, modern, abstract art. Like, it reminds me of something you'd find in, like, a Microsoft clip art or icons. Um, it's also worth noting the dice aren't etched in any way. These are printed. So over time, there is the possibility the sides will eventually get rubbed off, though I do expect that will take a long time and lots of plays. And with today's modern gaming society of one and done, I doubt anyone's going to play it enough for it to happen, but I figure it's worth noting. So how does a game of Back to the Future Dice Through Time play? All right, so you start by laying out the board putting a Biff standee on each Biff starting location. There's one Biff in all the times, uh, whether it's Biff or one of his relatives. Uh, event cards are shuffled, placed on their spot. Einstein tokens, Einstein being your dog, are flipped face down and randomized, placed beside the board with a bunch of paradox tokens. Players are then going to still like the color. They're going to take a playing board, the four dice in their color, or their DeLorean figure in that color. They're going to place the DeLorean on the clock tower space in their starting time period. Each of the four players starts at a different time. Players decide on a difficulty ranging from science experiment, beginner, to nobody calls me chicken, insane. 
and take the appropriate number of item cards for each time period, shuffle them, and place them beside the board. Start player is the player who has, so far, traveled the most through time, a.k.a. the oldest. Now, this doesn't directly impact this game specifically. It's more an overall comment. But does anyone not have Schwazi anymore? <laughs> I mean, do we actually need these arbitrary start player ideas in games? Because last week we had Brixton Brutes, which was the youngest player starts mm -hmm. or the oldest player starts. And the problem with that I have is that if a family sits down to a game, it's always going to be the same person who starts or mm -hmm. always going to be the same, uh, you know, if they're the youngest or always going to start start if it's the oldest. And you don't get that, you know, the chance for someone else to start, which Fair. I think detracts from uh, some gameplays. I do agree, though I got to say I kind of dig this one because it's one of the few ways the game actually ties in the theme of the game by throwing some time element to it. Um, I agree. I prefer to use Schwazi or some other, or uh, back in the day, I used to start player from Bezier games all the time. That was the game we played before we played the game. That's maybe a topic we could have during an AMA. Uh, thoughts on start players. I think Sean will probably have more to say. <laughs> but as for this one, start however you like. The rule book has you start with the oldest player. Or if you do have a time traveler who's traveled through more points in time than you, they would obviously start as well. So at the start of each turn, you're going to draw event cards. The event cards are based on the number of players. Special events are read out loud and cause something to happen. Like you've run out of gas, so you can't move as far this turn. Or um, There's a whole bunch of them. I'm not even going to get into the specifics. Most of the cards, though, are event cards that are tied to happenings in the three different Back to the Future movies. Each event happens at a certain time and space, and you the card shows it with, a, again, one of those graphics on it with a couple symbols at the top of the card. This is placed on the appropriate spot on the board. Once the events are played, again, based on the number of players, players will roll their four dice. Each turn, players spend dice to do actions. The various dice sides are flux capacitors. Spend that to move to the same location in any other year. Arrow, spend one of those to move to any location in the same year you're in. The fist is used to move Biff from your current location to any other location in the year. What Biff does is stops you from completing events. Lightning bolts let you re-roll any number of your other dice. The Doc Brown symbol, which I got to admit is the coolest symbol on the dice with the hair and the goggles, lets you remove Paradox tokens from anywhere on the board. More about those in a bit. And then there's the Wrench. Those can be used as any other icon when completing an event, which again, I'll get to in a second. Now, in addition to spending the dice based on what side you rolled, there are other important actions you can take. One that every player has is to use their Mr. Fusion in their DeLorean by spending two dice with the same icon to get any other icon. That's your little bit of randomness mitigation. Movement, you can spend any die with any icon to move one space in the current year, because the board's divided up into four years with five different spots at each year. Completing an event. This is part of the main goal of the game. You're going to spend dice matching the symbols on the event card. Remember I noted the event card has an icon in the top corner, or you're going to spend dice with those symbols on them. As long as Biff's not there. If Biff's there, he prevents you from doing so. When an event's completed, you're going to draw a random item card from that time period. No players can only hold two items at a time, but they can continue to complete events, which they may want to do to prevent paradox. Next is returning an item. So you've gotten an item from a previously completed event, you bring it to the right spot and place in time, and you, reward, you, you hand it in. As a reward, you're going to move the out-of-time marker back one spot. Uh, that's one of the end-game conditions we'll get to in a minute. And you're going to flip over an Einstein token. This is your helpful pup who's with you. Einstein tokens have the various dice size symbols on them, and then they go on the top of the board, and anyone can spend them later on a later turn. Then the most interesting and coolest thing in the game, in my opinion, is rippling a die. You leave a die on the space you're on. That die can now be used by any other player at the same location during that year or at the same location in any later year. So you can't have time travel if you can't send yourself or others resources through time anymore, it mm. seems. Uh, it's a great sort of mechanic or concept. It's not a, This is a specific mechanic to this game, but it's a great concept for a mechanic 
that we're seeing in variations of a few different games with, uh, yep. we, you know, we've got you're loaning yourself money in other games we've talked about recently. And, and this is, it's, it's a, an interesting concept for different mechanics that mm-hmm. uh, is, is slowly getting introduced more often. Now, once everyone's taken their turns, all the players have acted, they spent all their dice, they've rippled all their dice, they've done everything they want to do. You have this tracker at the top with the out of time license plate, and it's going to move up. That's based on how many active events there are in the most messed up year. And if that ever reaches spot 12, the game ends. And then at the end of every year, every year that's messed up starts generating, uh, drawing a blank on the word. Paradox? Yes, thank you. Paradox tokens get placed on those locations so it gets even worse. And that's where using those Doc Brown rolls to remove Paradox comes into play. Basically, it's the events get bad, and if you let them continue to get bad, there's a, there's a, a steamroller effect where it just keeps getting worse and worse. The players eventually win if they're able to return all of the items from all the different time periods to their proper place and time. And again, they lose if that out-of-time marker ever gets to the end of the track, which actually only has 12 spaces on it. Uh, simple enough, win-lose condi- uh, win, uh, win, lose conditions, to be sure. And just, just so everyone understands uh, who's listening, when we're saying out-of-time marker, it's actually a license plate that features the word all jammed together, out-of-time yeah, uh, all, all, all crammed together in a license plate format. And that is the license plate that's on the DeLorean in the movies, which is where that comes from. Now, before I start to share my final thoughts on this game, if it isn't evident yet, I want to make sure everyone knows what game we're talking about. This game in question is Back to the Future Dice Through Time from Ravensburger. This game I'm talking about is not Back to the Future Back in Time from Funko Games. What we have here is the same problem we have with Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion and Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion. A couple of games released almost at the same time within months of each other with the same intellectual property and similar names and not only that, similar mechanics. Yeah, and and The Shining as well. We ran into some name uh, collisions. It seems that instead of the old glut of mass market games we used to see, we're seeing people investing in real hobby games with those IP licenses but still spreading the wealth between various designers. Yeah. We've seen a number this year as anniversaries for various products have rolled around and, uh, and, and you know, triggered that uh, release schedule. Yeah, it's, I, I admit it's frustrating. Like this particular Back to the Future game, the one I'm reviewing here, is the lighter of the two games. This is much more of a gateway game and honestly probably the better choice of the two for younger and more casual players. Back to the Future Dice Through Time is surprisingly simple to learn and set up. Mechanics are simple to pick up. My kids got it pretty much right away. And then added to that, the gameplay is well facilitated by a very clean system of iconography that I found you can get used to very quickly. There aren't a lot of different symbols and the symbols are clearly explained. And adding to that, there's a bonus of the player boards each explain not only the game sequence, but what all the different icons mean. Yeah, the clear iconography is a great change from some recent games that have had a rather less clear marking problem Mm. uh, and led to gameplay issues and extreme play. It's good to see that this one has clearly avoided that pitfall. I will admit I wish they were a little bigger, but not everyone has the same aging eyes I do. Now, I said it before, and I'll say it again. The neatest bit in this game is the way the designers have done some cool stuff with the time travel thing. Like, the ripple mechanic's really brilliant. Like the fact you leave something in the past so themselves or another player can use it as long as they're in the same location in the same year or later. That's brilliant. That works great. The paradox rules also work pretty well, where if you let too many events happen in one year, it can be catastrophic. And there's a big penalty in the game if two players end up at the same location in the same time period. Because remember, everyone's playing the same two people. You're all playing Doc and Marty at different periods of time. And you never want to meet yourself in a time travel game or any other time travel story. That actually advances that out of time token two spaces. And again, it's only 12 long. So that's that's a rough one. Although, interestingly, Back to the Future's movies aren't even consistent with the whole meeting oneself paradox. Uh, in the first game, in the first movie, Doc makes a big deal out of it. Um, but uh, in the second movie, Biff and Jen both meet themselves uh, without any real consequences. Uh, so 
they've but it's nice that they've gone with that real you know the, the canon everyone mm. remembers the speech of doc brown you know you can't meet yourself Marty. um and that's and that's what they've gone with on this one though in this you can it is just moved up too so it right. can be worth it in games we have played we have chose the dec- decision to meet together because the end result was worth it that we cleared a, a difficult event or we were able to hand in two items so offset that time out of time marker moving up so it, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that you're penalized for doing it. Right. Now, unfortunately, those time travel mechanics we just talked about are pretty much the only places where the Back to Future theme really sticks out. Uh, the rest of the game's really pretty abstract. Like each location on the board holds three cards and there are only three cards per location in the entire deck of events. And there are exactly three cards per location in that deck. And these cards are basically identical. They have the exact same art on them. They have the exact same text. They have the exact same name. The only difference is the icons that come up. While these are all iconic scenes from the movies, there's nothing really other than that, again, very abstract graphics and the name of the card to tie it to it. Like there's no flavor text here. There's nothing really to explain what's going on. If you haven't seen the movies And to be honest, I started ignoring even what the cards said. I just looked at what icons they wanted. There wasn't a lot here that said Back to the Future to me. Right. And it certainly didn't help that they didn't get the rights to any actual imagery from any of the official properties to help make it feel more connected. Yeah, I agree. Uh, And the other complaint I have uh, is a lack of variety. Like we've had a handful of plays here and we've already seen every event in every time period. We've seen every special event. And every game has already started to feel the same. You're solving the same events with the same dice icons, trying to get the same icons or items and return them to the same places. Now, it's not to say that every game plays identical, like the order of the event cards, what items are in play each game, the vagaries of the dice and which Einstein tokens get flipped does add randomness and variability to each play, but just they all feel the same. You don't really get any difference between it. Right. So in many ways, uh, despite what I said earlier, this does seem feel like more of a mass market game than a hobby one. Uh, mm. Despite the quality components and, and well, uh, well made game, it's that same sort of play in and again feel you get from many of those mass market games, uh, as opposed to the difference between plays one often feels during a hobby game. Yeah, like like we had fun. It wasn't a terrible game. We had fun playing it. Um, I it it's lighter than i thought i was getting like i just from ravensburger um i expected well ravensburger makes kid games they made dice me or uh, king me and they they make you know um labyrinth but something about this box just i I expected more of a a, a strategy board game a heavier board game now the first place of course we were just with Deanna, and then i went wow this is light enough we should play this with the kids and that this ended up being a good family game a good family weight game my kids enjoyed it um nothing on the box to me says it's marketed to kids because I think mainly it's marketed to adults with nostalgia for Back to the Future. But I think this one is definitely more of a, a family weight lighter game, possibly on that mass market side, though better than many mass market games. It's it's on the, it's it's the blending, the, the it's yeah. kind of like the Euro and the Ameritrash blending together. You got the mass market and the hobby game blending together. This would fit perfectly well on a shelf at a scholar's choice. On Target would surprise me, except for the license. Now, I do have to say one kid did like it more than the other. Um, My youngest actually felt there was too much coordination and talking. Like there was just too much having to plan together as a group before taking your turn where she just wanted to do her thing. But she is the one that prefers competitive games to cooperative games. So fair enough on that one. Overall, I was impressed by the cool time travel mechanics, but I did find the connection to Back to the Future a bit weak. It just, it didn't feel like I was Marty and Doc thwarting Biff. It just felt like I was rolling dice, trying to match symbols and bringing cards to the right spot on the board. I do think this is a solid gateway cooperative game or family weight game. It's something with um, playing with kids, like kids that get into a game and just want to play it over and over and over again. They're not going to get as burnt out on it as quickly as uh, hobby gamers are. I think kids who like repetition are going to dig this game. I think for most groups, your average game group, probably most people listening to this podcast, I this is a try. Like, try it out before you buy it. Though if you have a family that's just like huge Back to the Future fans, and you know all the movies, and you know all the scenes, and you're going to get excited when you put down the skateboard in 1984 because Marty's on his way to school, 
you might want to give this one a chance like before playing it just go out and buy it and try it out but in general i do recommend to try before you play it's 1985 so i don't know what i said i said 84 so yeah, I, yeah. i'm not the huge back to the future fan that's one of the things we did to it. So, so one of the things this game will do is it will encourage your family to rewatch the movies or watch them for the first time if they haven't. I will admit this is important to note, actually. My kids had no experience with this other than the Telltale video game on the iPad. That's their only uh, Back to the Future experience. So they knew who Einstein was. That was about the only thing I, I noticed while playing. So, yes, yeah, so this will probably get us at some point as a family to sit down and rewatch the original trilogy. All right, then. Well, for more info on the Back to the Future Dice Through Time, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right, it's only a small handful of games played this last week. Lots of other stuff going on. Um, I don't talk about our online plays that often, but I do want to mention that we finally finished up that terrible game of Terra Mystica. Uh, we were complaining about this one before our break. I think everyone played poorly on this. Like, I don't even know how I got third. I am so glad this one is finally over. Uh, um, what I'm looking forward to is a new game that started, and I figured out there was a race I hadn't played before. So I am getting to try out the Darklings. They don't use white cubes to terraform at all and can't. Instead, you spend one priest for one shovel. I have no idea how I am going to be able to capitalize on that, but it'll definitely be interesting. Well, and I, I'm actually jumping on Giants for the first time, though I'm not sure how well it's going to go. Uh, for those who don't know, Giants, uh, it, two shovels transforms any t tile mm -hmm. into their home tile, but it has to be two shovels yep. every time. Um, but because I was the last to pick bonus tiles, uh, I was able to, to make the big jump I needed in that first turn. Huh? To, for for the future, but I because of the bonus tile I had to choose, I'm not getting the resources I wanted to get between yeah. uh, first and second turn. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, whether or not I can. I I realized that, so hopefully I can I can deal. But it's going to be interesting. I found giants really hard. I could not do giants. You got to up your terraforming, but to up your terraforming, you need a priest. And how do you get a priest early in the game? Yeah. And... Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I did not enjoy playing Giants. Uh, Deanna's <laughs> saying the same thing, too. She's saying basically the saddest, so she took the same race this game. And, yes, last game went so poorly. Like, I don't know what it was. Like, all of us, it just yeah. felt like that last game was just out the window. It was terrible. Yeah, I, I mean, I even had, I think I had the witch. I think I was using the witches. So, I mean, yeah, I should have had the best race, time. Yeah. Uh, and, and it went horribly. So, yeah. Uh, no. Uh, so another game we got down is we did finish another book in the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle. That was, again, all four of us playing this now. Uh, this was book three, and man, it was easy. Like, this was ridiculous. Easier than book one and two. Like, I, I wanted to take a picture at the end and ask, has anyone done this before? Because we only had two of the metal tokens on the first location of three. That's it. At the end, we won, and, like, like there was no challenge whatsoever. Um, we didn't even get to see what the other locations were. So... <laughs> That, that, was, that was a very different experience from any other play of that game before. Now, I don't know when we'll get to book four, but I got to say book four looks good. Like book four, that's a big box. Like, uh, you know what's in there. I don't know what's in there. I, I, have a, I, I have some ideas of what's in there. The kids have no clue what's in there. <laughs> and it's a big box. So I'm looking forward to that. And what'll be neat is that'll be all new. So like I mentioned before, I was playing through this with Big G, my oldest daughter, and we got to book three, but we never, we had an unlocked book four, but never tried it. So this is going to be brand new to all four of us. So it'll be our first time experiencing book four. Right. And I look forward to see hearing your thoughts on four, as that's the real meat of the game, uh, where it all mm -hmm. comes together. And in, in, in essence, you're playing the full game for the first time. Yeah, which is interesting because it says if you're an experienced deck builder player to start at book three. So I would have guessed that was the full game. But there's obviously something rattling around in box four <laughs> that's going to change things. And then um, Deanna and I have spent a few nights uh, drinking beers from the Craft Heads Advent calendar. We have had way too many sours. What the heck, Craft Heads? It's the winter. Why? Well, you make an Advent calendar and every other beer is a sour. I don't get it. Um, but anyway, we've been having a couple beers, well, a beer each every night and playing a whole bunch of Not Dice and now Not Dice Squared. Uh, trying out the various games. I, I got to say, the big thing we were sitting there and Deanna's looking at the dice after we played Hedgerows last night. And I shared pictures of that online because people want to see it. Um, also, thumbs up to uh, Matthew O'Malley for jumping on Twitter and like 
interacting with us as we share pictures of his game. I uh, gave Deanna props for destroying me in hedgerows. Um, looking at that game, I'm like, we this is so going to be the game we bring out to Jack's Castro Pub or where the next time we go to the Grove Ale House or when Sandwich Brewing opens up and, and we're able to sit with a pint of beer and play on a, a coffee table that's only two by two because once you have like the the game down that's all you need right as long as you don't bring one of the more complicated games with the tokens just being able to roll the dice and trying to play some of the the real time ones like there's some neat games that we haven't mentioned in the podcast where you're you both are trying to roll patterns at the same time you start with five dice and the first person to complete the pattern has to take a six die so it gets harder and then you keep rolling and rolling whoever completes the pattern gets to add another die and the first person to add the ninth die wins like there's some neat ones that i think will be good for that atmosphere and I've even got this perfect dice bag for this one. I've got a leather pouch with its purple and it's real leather with a knotwork pattern on it that I bought back when I was actually fiddling around with being in ska and I went to the Mount Holly Renaissance Fest and picked that up. So I think that's going to be my not dice pouch going forward. I actually do find it interesting that uh, with the blind beers in the advent cal- calendar being actually unlabeled, you would have made playing untapped really easier yep. yet you didn't for finally uh, finally you, you've stopped playing untapped yeah the reason why none of these beers would be on there right that's why they're too obscure that, that, that that's my complaint about um unlabeled is actually the name unlabeled of the game. sorry unlabeled the blind beer tasting game like every single one would have been in the weird sour spot or what there is no weird sour like wet hopped ipa what's a wet hopped I- that's not on the board that's it's our right. complaint is is craft heads really tried hard for to give us unique beers, I think. And I, I, I personally think they tried a little too hard. <laughs> and the ones I've really enjoyed are their standard beers. They're, they're, they're Squirrel Nut, uh, which, yes, it's called sewer, Squirrel Nut. Squirrel Nut, their brown ale, is really good. That one would have been on the board. Their, their peanut butter porter wouldn't have been on there. Like, there's just there's no peanut butter porter on that board. So we actually talked about it and decided against playing because there would be no point. Plus, because the beers aren't labeled, there's no IBUs listed. So that's another aspect of it we couldn't even do. Plus, we'd all guess the brewery right every time. No. <laughs> but yeah, the reason, it's it's the deficiencies of Unlabeled that stopped us from playing Unlabeled with this. Because yeah. that was actually Deanna's original when she bought this. Well, she didn't buy it. She convinced her mother, my, our mother-in-law bought it as a gift, but it was recommended or suggested, right? Right. But yeah, it's like, like, like there was a, a sorbet. Um, there was a sparkling something that wasn't even beer the one time i'm like what is this it said beer advent calendar don't give me a a spritzer that's what it was they gave us a spritzer and a beer calendar anyway this is more after show content all right well we we gotta talk about board games well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming (laughs) weeks all right so christmas hits friday uh new year's a week later i have no clue we'll see i i don't know i do know the kids are getting a few games for christmas so we may some some of those played um i don't I, i'm gonna guess because of the number of games and the pile of obligation i won't bother trying to unbox them uh usually what i do with the kids is i say it's up to you if you really want to open them you can open them but dad would like to unbox them and it's up to you if you want to wait and i might offer to unbox them with them but probably we're just going to let them tear into those on christmas morning um those are obviously not obligation games i, I do not gift the uh review copies we get from people to my kids um so i'm looking we might see those get played i don't know um i've got a huge box over here that i'm going to be opening up during the after show tonight and that might lead to some unboxing videos but to be honest uh at this point we're playing it by year i don't know it's 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 the holidays <laughs> who knows we, we still don't have our tree decorated so it's up the tree's up there's no presents under it. we got stuff to wrap i don't know if it'll be time to play games not ready Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, Andrew Dacey, thank you. I am Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering at twitch.tv slash misdirectedmark. And at this point, they are back the day this show goes live. They are returning after a break. Uh, Joe Swick, thanks so much for your support. Evil John, we need to get back to that game of the crew, maybe mm-hmm. this coming weekend. Well, well, that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. I think the portcullis was already down because Ryan couldn't make it in tonight. 
Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up to the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts and our drive to improve our content, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.